Buenas tardes, good afternoon, and welcome to the Instituto Cervantes uh, Leeds and Manchester YouTube channel. This afternoon, we have the honor of presenting Raúl Garrigazait's uh, Roman novel, The Others. For this, we have the presence of the author and also Thiago Miller, who has been in charge of his translation from Catalan in English, and Cristina Pla, who will be in charge of introducing our guests and also moderating the debate. We also have the presence of Douglas Hotel from the, uh, from the uh, editing uh, firm Fundes Tampa, who has been uh, made a project possible through the uh, editing of the book and also in helping with the organization of this uh, event. Thank you very much to all of you for joining us. And uh, it is a great honor for Instituto Cervantes to have you here. And it's a great privilege to be able to present this excellent book uh, that shows the great vitality of the literature in Catalan. As uh, you know, uh, it's something very clear, very obvious, but it's good to uh, underline. The vitality of the uh, Catalan literature is a reality. And uh, from the uh, tradition of uh, Joseph Pla, uh, Carmen Riera, and many others, we have the new generations who are creating poets. We have also poets in Catalan. Uh, not so long ago here in the Leeds Institute also. And today we have this uh, uh, excellent uh, book, a novel from Gargisar It, this new uh, uh, generation of, of writers who are giving a new impetus to the great uh, Catalan literature. And now let me now you uh, to present uh, the moderator, Cristina Pla, who is a lecturer in Spanish at the Center of Foreign Languages uh, Studies at the Doran University. She holds a PhD in Spanish literature by the University of Manchester. And her research focuses on autofiction and literary criticism performed from within novels themselves, particularly in the works of Enrique Vilamatas and Roberto Bolaño. She has taught Catalan and Spanish at several U United Kingdom universities and he has also led cultural events at Instituto Cervantes Leeds, such as the Reading Club and the Writing Micro Theatre Workshop. Thank you very much, Cristina, for your uh, support and thank you all to our audience and give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. And um, thank you everyone for being here. And um, I'd like to introduce Raul and Tiago. Um, and because today we're here to, to present this great novel, uh, Alza Strange or The Others. And well, I think it's a, it's a fascinating novel. I really enjoyed it. And um, well, it has won the Premi Liberate in 2017 and also the Premi Omnium to the best novel in Catalan. Um, so without further ado, a little bit about um, Raúl Garriga Said. He's an, he's an award-winning novelist, essayist and translator. His novel, The Others, uh, won, as I said, Premi Liberté and Premi Omnium in 2017. Garriga Said translates from Greek and German and has brought the likes of Plato and Goethe into the Catalan language. A doctor in classical philology at the University of Barcelona, he also acts as the director of La Casa dels Classics, a project that works to promote the creation and promotion of universal classics in the Catalan language. His great novel has been translated by Tiago Miller, uh, who is a writer and translator based in Lleida. He has worked on the translations of a number, number of Catalan writers, such as Pere Caldés and Raúl Garriga Said, and his articles on language, politics, and literature have appeared in Núvol and La República. He is currently working on the first book-length translation of Montserrat Roig into English. Um, and before I start asking, Many questions. We also have a visitor from, from Funda Stampa. And uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about why have you decided to bring uh, Catalan literature into the UK? Uh, and also, what sort of reception are you having? Um, well, yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks very much. And it's lovely to be here. Can you, can you hear me OK? Yeah. Yes. OK, right, because it's a bit blustery here, you see, so I'm not <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, um, why did I decide to do that? I don't really know why I decided to do it. Um, it seemed like a good idea at the time, I suppose. Um, you know, they say 
when you're writing a book, they say write about what you know. And I guess I sort of knew one or two things about uh, Catalan literature. Uh, I love the language. Um, I love the culture. I think it's a very, very special uh, place. Um, and I suppose, yeah, I mean, from the standpoint, the project is just a culmination of... Um, of these little these little grains of sand that have sort of been put together to to build a little sand castle, I suppose. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose perhaps the idea first started, um, you know, sort of first sort of germinated um, with this idea of you know reading bits and bobs here and there and thinking, you know, oh, wow, that, that's that's really a great book, and then thinking, well, you know, I'd like to share it with my friends or family, and of course not being able to, and I so. You know, I started, I don't know, just sort of mulling it over, so to speak. Um, yeah, and I'm pretty sure, I'm, well, I'm pretty happy the way, the way it's, been, it's been received. Um, I think, um, you know, the, the UK uh, indie press sort of sector is, is very uh, receptive to translation in, in literature. And um, and the, the the project has been very well received um, so far. I think, um, well, yeah, I mean, we've, you know, regardless of the language, you know, the translation literature is is, is important, and people people enjoy it, um, and it's it's growing. I think year on year. I mean, perhaps it, it didn't grow too much in the last couple of years, but anyway. Um, yeah, and I think you know there, there's there's an interest in in Catalan language um, in general, as in you know the, the the question is often sort of asked. Oh right, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I've heard of Catalan now. You know, but what is it, sort of thing. Um, you know, and so people sort of show interest. They're always you know looking for new things, and uh, yeah, I mean, I mean to be completely honest. Um, I think the most important thing, you know, I mean, the the fact that it's Catalan literature in translation isn't isn't necessarily the most important thing when it comes to selling the books. You know, the most important thing has to be, you know, it's a great book, it's a great story, it's well written. That's number one. Uh, the fact that it's from Catalan is is I hope merely a secondary sort of selling point in the sense that oh well, you know. It's something new. It's perhaps a, a voice that I haven't heard before. It's an idea that I haven't thought of. Um, but yeah, I mean, first and foremost, the books just have to be just have to be really, really good. I can't, I, I can't sell. I wouldn't be able to sell a single copy of any book uh, simply off the back that that it's it was translated from Catalan. Uh, it has to be great. It has to be a great story. It has to be a, it's been really well written. It has to be wonderfully translated, and that's that's the goal. Um, the fact that they're they're originally written in Catalan, um, you know, it's kind of I guess it's kind of the niche, isn't it, that people look for. I mean, you know, more and more in the indie presses are, are looking for that niche, um, and you know, it, I guess it's a way of 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 playing the the David against the Goliath of of the larger uh, not non indie presses, so to speak. Um, but yeah, as I said, you know, um, the, the publishing house was born from from a love, basically, for for the Catalan people, their language, their culture, their food. Not bad. Um, and you know, it kind of. But it's but first and foremost, it has to be a great story. It has to be, you know, fantastic. It's a strange sort of thing, really. I mean, um, you know, there are certain and. There are certain writers. Let's let's take, for example, Joseph Pla, who you know, on on a Catalan level, um, is is a massive writer. You know, I mean, he I could even say he is the big writer, perhaps. Now, you know, let's imagine that that tomorrow, a new book is unearthed, you know, in his archives and it's being published. Now, you know, that that would that would bring Catalan book selling to a standstill. You know, I mean, that would be a big big thing. Now I translate it and I and I put it into to put it into English. The question would probably be generally, who's this Joseph Pla? You know, 
So that's one of the unique challenges, I think, of, of bringing translated literature to, well, I mean, bring, bringing any new author, uh, be it, you know, be it, be it directly into English or translated into English, into the into a new market is, um, you know, I mean, that's 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 a challenge, but I think it's I think it's a beautiful challenge, um, and that's one of the things that you know I'm very very keen to do at from the standpoint, um, you know, sort of, um, what's the word, you know, uh, believe not so much in necessarily the the piece of work, the book, the title, but rather believe in the author, basically. Um, because I think that's the way well, that's the way it has to be, basically. <laughs> anyway, sorry if I've if I've gone on a little bit. No, thank you. It was it was great to, to hear you explain all that and with such passion, you know, for <laughs> what you do. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that as we go on, plenty of questions will come up to the, the, the minds of everyone who's, who's listening. So please, if you do have questions, pop them on the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, either as we go on or at the end of the session. Um, well, I would like to start with a, a question for Raul. And I was wondering, we have seen over the last few years a boom of like people writing about the civil war and the civil war. And then you, you chose to write about a war. But a car the Carlist word, no? And then tell us about how do you choose a different word to start with? Yeah, yeah. The first thing, uh, hi everyone. Uh, the first thing I have to say is that the Carlist words are an exotic, an, an exotic subject even for a Catalan readership. So they, they are not well known. The Carlist words are, are uh, 19th century words, and if you if you read um, the history handbook. Uh, it will probably say that uh, it, it was a war between uh, the past and the future, between um, um, between royalists and liberals, and between the old ancien regime and the new uh, state, new bureaucracy, and the new uh, rationality. So to say, it's it's the simple, it's the most uh, I would say the most common view of the Carlist wars. It's it's. Uh, it were wars about modernity, about the birth of modernity in Spain. Uh, this is true, but the Carlist wars were very complex at the same time, and they have uh, several levels. And um, I, I, I tend to see them, mainly the first Carlist war, as a, as a wild reaction against the new rationality of the state and the new discipline of, of the modern state. So it's... It's a subject in, uh, I find very interesting because it allows me to, to write about uh, a certain irrationality we have uh, within us, which, is, which never leaves us. It's, it's always there somehow. So, so it was, uh, yeah, it, 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 it was very interesting for me to, to take this, this words because it's, it's, a, it's a, one of the subjects of the novel, the, 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 this conflict between rationality and uh, irrationality and between madness, so to say, uh, so to speak. And um, yeah, this was the first thing that there were a lot of reasons. Uh, I come from a from a from a small town in in the center of Catalonia, which has a lot of Carlist memories, so to speak. It, uh, we have we yeah we remember uh, some Carlist warriors and and uh, the landscape is, is full of old houses uh, which hosted uh, yeah, Carlist soldiers. So uh, it was a way to speak about uh, a landscape, a, a place uh, I care about. Uh, it was, yeah, it, it, it was a, a way to, to mix history and present. And the, the things I, I see, the things I, yeah, I live every day, and and the history of my country, which is uh, mainly a history of violence and a bit, yeah, a tragic history in, in a way. Thank you. So, would you say if if a reader comes um, and comes to the book and they are like, oh yes, I'm going to read a historical novel? <laughs> yeah. You, what, what happens to them then? No, oh, yeah, the, yeah. This is a bit a problem I had with some readers because it's not a historical novel. <laughs> it it looks like a historical novel if you read the the, the resume, but but actually there was I think the last review uh, I read in in English uh, was about the, the the surprise of of 
reading um, the others as a historical novel and realizing that it, it had nothing to do with historical novels. It's not, it's not a, a novel about war, about uh, heroism. Uh, it's, it's just a, a novel about otherness, about waiting, about incommunication. Um, I think it has more to do with, for instance, uh, Kafka's Castle, which is a novel about waiting, about being lost in the world. It has more to do with, with this kind of novels than with uh, yeah, long historical novels about uh, battles and kings and, and this kind of things. Yes, <laughs> indeed. I think that's precisely what's very enjoyable about the novel, actually, as well, like this, uh, the way it works. Um, I have a question for Tiago as well. Um, a part of this otherness that happens in the novel is when the main character cannot communicate very well, doesn't understand very well. Like he, like people in, not the, the characters he encounters speak half in Spanish, half in Catalan or in different uh, registers of Catalan. How did you work this through to the English translation? Um, well, first of all, hi to everyone. Thanks, Christina, for, for such a great question. Listen, it's it, it, it took time. It took me uh, probably to get about halfway through the novel until I was kind of sure how a lot of these characters would speak. Um, Raoul really plays with um, the idea of uh, bilingualism in the novel and the different registers between Castilian and Catalan. We often see as well uh, one character who mixes both Carlos rhetoric with, with uh, Sol Soni. So you've got two registers and uh, two languages and mixed into that an awful lot of uh, comedy and exaggeration. So there's a lot going on. So at first, you know, it was with regard to the Shambolic Six and, and the, 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 their Sol Soni, um, it was evident that they would have to speak obviously non-standard English. Um, the central element of this novel is there's a real sense of place. We're always aware that this is taking place in Solsona. Um, and Solsoni is, 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 is central to that, to that idea. So that had to be communicated as well. The dialect, if you, if, you, if you put it in non-standard English, but there's no element of it being in any particular dialect, then you lose a really fundamental part of what Raoul was trying to communicate, I feel. But evidently, you can't just swap one dialect for another. You can't swap Solsoni for, for, for an English or British dialect. So, yes, elements, are, well, non-standard elements of, of localisms. But as I got further into the novel, I, I found myself asking, you know, what is what is being trans, transmitted here? What's being communicated? And that's what you you end up translating beyond the words, what they're what they're trying to put across. So, you know, I, I've. I feel it's quite lucky in the sense that Catalan humor and English humor is very similar in many ways. Um, so I felt that I was able to draw on a lot of things from my own memories, as Ra Raul does. Um, I think he, obviously there's a lot of humor in the way that these characters speak, but I think there's a lot of love. I mean, it's, we're not, I don't think we're laughing at the characters. There's a, there's a sort of camaraderie. I think there's a celebration of, of this, uh, so I was I felt able to draw on on certain aspects from my family or from certain um, comedy programs as well. I think there's a certain humour that English readers can connect with because we know this stuff through Monty Python and through Samuel Beckett and through certain elements of Shakespeare and the Young Ones. You know all of this mad stuff that um, I think comes across in Raoul's writing. In terms of the Carlos rhetoric, well, I mean, really, that's kind of sort of trying to emulate uh, this very Latinate style that English writers from the 18th century were convinced English had to be had to sound like. So it's kind of just trying to exaggerate this uh, overblown floral Baroque style of English that sounds incre feels incredibly false. Um, what else? Playing around as well, playing around with language, because where you have, you know, with, with Raoul is looking at, I feel, the stories in between official 
the official histories, official ways of speaking. It's, it's, it's these spaces in between where people really communicate. And I think that's where I had to kind of get with my translation was between official forms of, of speaking. And that's where the where I think the truth really was. And yeah, that took that took a bit of time. Yeah, I can imagine it's a lot yeah. of work, <laughs> lots of detail, lots of nuancing. And the character, part of the way it's it's written is that the main character feels often disoriented because he's not sure he's understanding what he's being told. Did you yeah, ever worry I about think anyone that studied a language, I think can can <laughs> can understand what how Vilaman feels. You know, there are still moments when I when I've less and less, but I go back to feeling like when you first start learning a language and someone says something and you just nod because you think, well, I think they're expecting a yes. So I'll just say, I'll just nod. Oh no, that was, that sounded like that was expecting a no. So I'll just shake it. You know, Vilaman's <laughs> in that kind of, in that kind of state. Um, and it, it's a temporary, he's not, he's not, he hasn't gone there to think, you know, I want to learn about this culture and I want to stay here. He knows it's temporary from the start. So it's a, it's a tricky, a tricky situation. Just to go back to what Raul said about Kafka, and this is something, this is kind of direct question at Raul was, I wondered if, if when I, when I was translating the novel, I felt that, well, before I translated, when I was reading it, I felt that there was an element of waiting for Godot, but it, it's kind of felt, I mean, I might be off the mark. I don't know if you were, had this in mind when you were writing, but I felt that it was even worse because at least uh, Vladimir and Gogol are kind of waiting for something. Wieleman doesn't even know what he's waiting for. It's an empty wait, which I think existentially is even more, which is even worse. Sorry. I can't hear you, sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, I, I didn't have it in my mind, so uh, uh, yeah, it just, it, it was maybe some somewhere <laughs> behind me, but um, I really had, I really, yeah, uh, uh, thought of uh, several 20th century novels, like uh, some novels by Dino Vuzzati, for instance, or, or Kafka, those novels that uh, about characters that don't, yeah, that, that are lost in the world, that don't know where they are going to, that they are waiting for something, but uh, yeah, it never comes. So that, that kind of thing, and, and, and it has to do with Beckett as well. So of course, it's, it's the same kind of, of existential lostness, I would say. Sorry, Christine, I interrupted you. you were gonna... No, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. And talking about humor as well, I had the impression that there was quite a bit of influence from grotesque humor in the novel as well. Maybe, maybe even from El Buscon, or this is the kind of moments that came to my mind when I was reading. Could you tell us a bit more about this, Raúl? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the the the. The book has several levels of, of representation of reality. There are several language layers, for instance. There's the language of, of, the, of the illiterate soldiers, and, and there is the Latinate language um, um, Tiago mentioned. And, and there are several kinds of humor as well uh, attached to, to these different characters. And the, the, um, the pages that talk about the shambolic six uh, in, in Tiago's wonderful translation, the shambolic six are six illiterate soldiers that come from the common people and go to war just because it's something they, they well, they, they can do, but they don't believe in anything. They are not uh, carlists. They, they are just there in the middle of a war. And, and they are the kind that, that kind of, of popular characters, of, of common, of low characters that uh, in, in literature from Shakespeare to Monty Python are, are full of humor and, and, and yeah, in a way it's impossible to talk about them without uh, some comic scenes, so to say, so to speak. And at the same time, but, uh, for me, it was very important what Tiago mentioned. I, I don't want to, to uh, uh, um, yeah, to laugh about them. I, I really, I really feel, in a certain way, I feel them very familiar. I, I, I they are similar to my friends, so to say. So uh, I try to speak about them with love because I, because I think they represent a, a really true experience of the world. 
and um, it's it's a it's a comical and, and tragical experience at the same time. Uh, and, and there is comedy and tragedy and tragedy in life, so uh, it's it's something that has to be represented in in literature as well. And I, I wanted to ask you, coming back to what uh, Tiago was saying about your interest in, in telling stories different or how they're told, tell us how did you, why did you choose to tell us a story which is mediated? Um, because it's it's not the protagonist telling us the, sto us the story, but the translator telling us a story. And also linking with that, the question for both of you, how did you feel both when, when writing and when translating the novel about this translator that doesn't translate and goes off <laughs> on tangents? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. It's a, as, as I said, it's a novel about incommunication and communication as well, and and so it was it was very useful for me uh, to have a, a narrator that is a translator as well, because translators work with communication and incommunication at the same time, uh, and it was. Uh, the, the narrator's voice is, is a Catalan voice that speaks about a German character. So there is always this, this distance. And the, the main character is a German aristocrat that comes south, that, that uh, comes to Catalonia to fight with the, with the Carlist uh, side. So um, there, there are a lot of, of, well, there's a lot of otherness, so to say, of, of seeing, of, of, yeah, of voices that speak about voices that have other points of view. And, and this is the reason why I wanted to have a, a narrator that speaks from the present and speaks from, uh, from Sulsona or from Barcelona uh, and from, from the present about uh, uh, a past life and, and a, a past world that is very different from his world, but at the same time, it has uh it it speaks to him so to say it it uh, so to speak it it in a way um it relates to his world and uh and so one of the things novel tries to do is to uh to create compassion or or empathy for people who had entirely different lives who come from other places and have and can't communicate with the people around them, but they share some things in the in the in the novel. They share, for instance, um, the the things the, the 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 things that come through the senses. That they share food, they share music, they share landscape, uh, and th this is the reason why the novel. Uh, it's 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 actually a novel about about the senses. I would say in in many parts, it's a novel that has very long descriptions of music and quite long descriptions of food as well, uh, because th these are the things that could unite uh, a young aristocrat from Prussia who doesn't speak a word of Catalan with uh, the, the people he meets. Yeah, well, how did you tell us about, how did you do with these, um, with these descriptions? Because they are so sensorial, I like, Sometimes you're looking at a table of food and the food is so specific. And, and not, not only that, also with scenery as well. You know, there is a fragment where the scenery, and for me, being Catalan and, and knowing the area, maybe like it's almost sensorial, like how you go from one bit of vegetation to the change in the ground, you know. And I was thinking, wow, how did you go about translating this? Um, well, certainly the long, there are a couple of, moments where there's some long long passages of very lyrical prose um specifically in chapter five when um there's a description of the beethoven sonata and and later on when Wieleman and foreste walk from solsonata to a small village and they walk through the hills and the mountains the pre-pyrenees and there's some very long lyrical descriptions of 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 the uh, geography and the, and landscapes really with i mean with these with these two specific passages it's just a lot of work a lot of reading a lot of i like to record my um what i've written so myself reading it record it listen back listen for the rhythms because that's essentially what in the original what's being certainly with the well i think with both even with the landscape it's a sense of rhythm throughout these uh, these passages to be honest the the main challenge actually was was moving between all these different styles that are present in the book um, and a lot of them the changes are very subtle 
uh, and a lot of changes, there's changes between chapters. So you have to make sure that there's a fluidity between the, the styles. There's also changes within chapters, which are very subtle and you have to have a keen eye, which is, was the wonderful thing about translating this book because it takes you back to being a reader, you know, and, and giving this book a really close reading to pick up on all these changes. I mean, if you just look at the first chapter, you have a sense of uh, autofiction, perhaps, if, you know, if we could put it in that in those terms. And then secondly, there's a quite absurd, the absurd entrance of the king into Solsona. And then we go into grotesque with um, when Vilamun goes into the church. And then when he meets the, the, the Shambolic, Six, Shambolic Six, we have a sense of absurdism. And then the third chapter opens with a dream. So there's a lot to take a lot to translate, but a lot of fun. Um, and I feel that I, I, it helped me as well, knowing Solsona and knowing the geography around the city as well, that, that, that certainly helped. Yeah, I think it always helps knowing what you're talking about when you're translating something anyway. Yeah. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe you could read us some fragments uh, from the novel for us to get yeah. more of an idea. Yeah, I mean, well, in terms of knowing Solsonitis to say as well, I mean, uh, Raoul will give you, will be able to tell us if I'm right or wrong, but I, you know, there's a lot of, for me, uh, uh, similarities between Yeda Dan Solsoni in many aspects. And when I read the novel, I recognized my friends in these, in, in these characters as well. So that certainly helped um, translating a lot of the dialects, you know, the dialogue. Um, being familiar with 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 a lot of these terms, but anyway, yeah. Um, something to do with the landscape, or should we do something from the the musical? Uh, maybe we could read the the musical description on chapter yeah. five. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to head, head off first, and then? Um. Okay. Um, we in the original, it's. In the original, it's uh, page 46. Yeah, yeah. Carabé imperceptible al inici. Uh huh. Yeah, we're going from there. Oh, from Al que va passar a continuació, from the previous uh, paragraph. Okay. Okay. It's a, it's a description of, um, of, uh, uh, well, it's, uh, I'll say something about this chapter. Uh, in, in this chapter, the, the, the main character, uh, this, this uh, Russian aristocrat, meets uh, a, young, um, a young doctor from Sulsona, and, and they, uh, they, well, they don't know each other, but uh, the, the young doctor uh, is learning piano playing, so he's trying to play his piano, very bad piano, and then Willemann sits, um, uh, in front of the piano, he starts playing. He plays a, a Beethoven, uh, a, a Beethoven sonata, and uh, the 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 doctor is uh, is amazed at, at that music. It's the first time he hears somebody playing really good, uh, uh, really well, uh, a Beethoven sonata. So, and this is the description of of uh, the of this moment. <clears throat> El que va passar a continuació és difícil de buscar en paraules i impossible de fer reviure. Però si no ho intentés, no hi hauria manera de comprendre la història que vull explicar. Recordeu que en aquella època, tota la música era experiència fugaç i irrepetible del present, que cada execució era un do insubstituïble perquè no existien els enregistraments musicals. Després, poseu sobre cada frase meva el record íntim d'alguna descoberta, d'algun tros de vida vostra que us semblés ple de promeses complertes i de profecies inesperades. Així, aquestes pàgines potser no seran totalment mudes. Gairebé imperceptible a l'inici, va sonar una greu progressió d'acords martellejats, amb petites frases melòdiques que els sobrevolaven ocasionalment. Era una progressió rara que passava de la plenitud del mode major a una melancolia apressada en mode menor. La música creixia, la melodia s'enlairava, convertida en refilets fins a arribar un forte, Aleshores, tot afluixava i s'aturava sobre la tònica, ara fràgil i indecisa. Assegut a la butaca, el metge s'aguantava la respiració, una mica inclinat cap endavant. Recomençava la mateixa frase, més sonora, més aguda, 
i es disparava altre cop una rastallera de corxeres frenètiques. Venia un forte i tres forts andis seguits, i la melodia decreixia saltirons, en staccato, modulant d'una manera que el metge no havia sentit mai, fins que desembocava en un tema coral i plàcid i assossegat, com un migdia lluminós a muntanya. I l'home aixecava el cap, omplia els pulmons, esbatanava els ulls, i era com pujar una margera de rocs i herbes que fan nusos als turmells, i veure una gran plana de verd llampant amb minúscules colles de gent asseguda, estirada, refent-se d'algun desastre natural amb la gratitud dels supervivents, oblidant-ho tot, renaixent a un món feliç. Es va encaixar més bé a la butaca. Les notes es barrejaven i es multiplicaven i quedaven suspeses i quan ja no sabia on volien anar a parar van tornar els acords inicials, ara més perfilats, en pianíssimo però amb l'ímpetu d'una joventut abocada al furor de la vida. I va sonar novament tot el que ja havia sonat, tot igual però amb més precisió amb una exactitud inversemblant. I ho sentia amb una exaltació interior trepidant i temible perquè li semblava incontrolable. I les mans començaven a viatjar. Ja coneixia els acords martellejats, els arpegis i les escales que els envoltaven. Ara es desplaçaven amunt i avall del teclat, amunt i avall del món. Vorejaven les esplugues més fosques i humides de la contrada. S'elevaven de sobte cap a la claredat inhumana del cel. S'estenien i s'arrupien. Dibuixaven una dansa a l'horitzó, remotíssima fins a perdre's, besardosa. A la butaca, el cirurgià insinuava una imitació de dansa amb els peus, amb les puntes dels dits, amb el cap. Ara les imatges eren una tempesta, una plana assolellada, una multitud vociferant, una calamarsa de mars, una multitud silenciosa. Però cap marejador, un exili llarg, la plana dels supervivents, resistència de l'arada, una vibració de venes i artèries i músculs, un adeu inevitable, els plaers de l'amistat, una torre alta, tot barrejat en una discordança impossible. I alhora, totes aquestes imatges eren falses i insuficients, com si a l'inici del temps el creador hagués posat les seves idees sobre la Terra i després les hagués apartat totes de cop amb un moviment de braç i només hagués restat la remor indescriptible d'abans del començament del món i qualsevol imatge fos una profanació però no deixessin d'aparèixer imatges. El metge aclucava els ulls. El metge se sentia immensament agraït. La remor s'allargava, s'intensificava, apareixien refilets per dalt de tot, fugissers, inaccessibles, cada cop més insistents, i a l'últim els acords martellejats del principi retornaven com una innocència perduda. I després, aquell cant coral que semblava un migdia lluminós, extraviat entre setmanes de tempestes, i com que no n'hi havia prou, ressonaven novament els acords martellejats del començament, més agitats, atropellant-se els uns als altres, paralitzant-se, dissolent-se en un cant de gratitud, un sospir, una darrera insinuació, la percussió definitiva. El metge obria els punys i estava a punt d'aplaudir, però no va poder. What happened next is difficult to evoke with words and impossible to restore to life. But if I don't at least try, I fear Wieleman's story will fall on deaf ears. First and foremost, bear in mind that in those days, given sound recording didn't exist, all music was a fleeting and unrepeatable experience, and each performance an irreplaceable gift. Afterwards, infuse each of my words with the intimate memory of some discovery, of some slice of your life that seemed abounding with fulfilled promises and unexpected prophecies. Thus, perhaps these pages will not remain completely silent. Almost imperceptible at the beginning, a deep progression of repeated chords rose up with short, melodic, short melodic phrases gliding occasionally over them. It was an unusual progression that passed from the plenitude of the major mode to a hasty melancholy in minor mode. The music grew and the melody began to soar, transforming into roulades until it reached a forte, whereupon everything softened and paused on the tonic, now fragile and hesitant. The doctor, sitting in one of the armchairs, held his breath and leant forward slightly. The same phrase began again, only louder and higher, and another row of frenetic quavers raced off before coming to a forte in three esposandi. The melody descended in leaps, in staccato, modulating in a way the doctor had never heard before, until flowing into a choral, placid, peaceful theme, like a sunlit afternoon in the mountains. He raised his head, filled his lungs, opened his eyes and it was like climbing a rocky path lined with plants that wrap around one's ankles and seeing a sweeping plateau of tiny groups of people stretched out amid the lush green 
recovering after some natural disaster with the gratitude of survivors, forgetting everything, being born again into a brave new world. He sat more comfortably in the armchair. The notes merged, they, mot they multiplied, they hung in midair, and when he no longer knew what they would do next, they returned to the opening chords, now with greater definition in pianissimo, but with all the impetus of youth rushing headfirst into the furor of life, and then everything that had already been played was played again, identical, but with more accuracy, with implausible precision, and he felt it with a frenetic, fearsome inner ecstasy because it seemed so uncontrollable. Then his hands began to travel. He was already acquainted with the chord progression, the arpeggios and the scales surrounding them. Now they moved up and down the keyboard, the length and breadth of the world. They skirted the mouths of the deepest, darkest caves. They rose up suddenly towards the sky's cruel clarity. They stretched and curled and drew a dance along the distant horizon, so remote it was unnerving. The surgeon slowed, slowly began something resembling a dance with his feet, his fingertips, his head. Now the images were a storm, a sunlit plain, a vociferous multitude, a silent, a spring shower, a silent multitude, a dizzy, dizzying rock face, a long exile, the plateau of survivors, passionate resistance, a vibration of veins and arteries and muscles, an inevitable farewell, the pleasures of friendship, a looming tower, all of it blending into an impossible discordance. Yet at the same time, all of those images were false and insufficient, as if at the beginning of time, the creator had laid his ideas upon the earth and then swept them away with one movement of his arm. And all that remained was the indescribable sound from before the dawning of the world. And any image was defamation, but that didn't stop them from continuing to appear. The doctor closed his eyes and felt an immense feeling of gratitude. The sound grew in length and intensity. Roulades appeared above everything, fleeting, inaccessible, but with increasing insistence until the opening harmony returned like lost innocence. And then the same choral song that was like a sunlit afternoon lost amid weeks of stormy weather. Yet still it went on because those repeated chords from the beginning rang out again, more rousing than before, running over the top of one another, coming to a standstill, dissolving into a song of gratitude, a sigh, a final insinuation, the definitive strike of the key. The doctor unclenched his fists, ready to applaud but didn't have time. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you. It's, it's fantastic to listen to. Mm. Thank you. Um, in, in this novel, there are so many mo moments like this, no? almost of um, elation, no? like it's introspection, but at the same time, it's like a liberating moment. Would you agree that it's a, would you describe the novel as an optimistic novel or a novel about freedom in a way? Uh, who are you asking, Thiago or, or me? <laughs> both, both, both of you, I think. <laughs> it's very positive. I think essentially the, the central theme is one of friendship and the ability yeah. to overcome <clears throat> the inevitable confusion of existence and existing with oneself and with others. We can overcome that through music, through through sensual experiences. I think that's incredibly positive. Yeah. Yes, the, so the, there, there is comedy. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, please, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I agree. So th there is some tragedy in the novel. Actually, there's a war going on, but but um, it's true that the novel is about uh, two two guys who meet each other in 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 the middle of a war and they actually they they don't they don't agree with each other the the doctor is not not clearly a catalyst he's rather liberal but he works with the catalyst he's a very ambiguous character but they share something and they share mm, i would say moments of happiness uh, in in a way of, of sensorial happiness of, of walking through uh, yeah, walking through the hills or, or listening to music or eating together uh, and learning things about the world, about, uh, about the confusion of the world, uh, I would say in, in a certain way. There's a, um, as, I, as I said, the catalyst wars are normally presented as, as a very black and white war, uh, a war about mm, yeah, conservatives and liberals and and, and about the past and the future. And there is a scene in the novel where they speak, 
the doctor and, and Willemann, they speak about uh, a person, uh, about a man, Gayetar Ripoll, who was the last uh, man who was sentenced to death by an ecclesiastical court. Uh, he, we, we could say he was the last victim of the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, he was he was sentenced to death in in the 1820s, so it just two centuries ago, and he, he's not very well known. But but uh, I know him because he came from my town, so it's a uh, it's a local character, so to say, uh, so to speak. Sorry, and um, um, and thus and they talk about this character, and it's it's a he was a victim of Inquisition, so in a way he was a, a he was a martyr for reason and for freedom and and yeah he could be um understood in this way but as at the same time when they when they when they speak about this story they realize that it's not quite simple that um Gayetar Ripoll actually he was not an atheist he was a believer he was a, an enlightened believer he believed in a rational god in in a god of light and reason and he was not a Catholic. He he rejected the, the Catholic ritual. And this is the reason why he was sentenced to death. So he was not sentenced because he was not a believer, but, be, but because he believed in other things, or, or he had another way of believing. So it was not a conflict between, between belief and reason. It was something more complicated and more interesting, I find. And it's a way of, yeah, it's a moment when the... Uh, the, the characters or, or Willemann realizes that that there are no wars between black and white. There are no wars between the past and the future. That, that humanity is everywhere. Every and it's it's always full of myths and full of beliefs and full of reason and and it's it's always like this. You cannot destroy these elements in in the human being. And uh, have you, you were telling us about also how Willemann and Furaste, you know, the doctor, they, they don't agree on everything. Do you find that perhaps in the current climate, like political climate, so, so much crispation and so on, there is some, some readings of your novel? I know it was written uh, a bit before like the current moment, but have you found that people read it politically in a way? Have you, how, how are you finding that? Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the, uh, I wrote the novel in, in, uh, yeah, in, it was in, in 2015, 2016, more or less, for, yeah. Uh, and, uh, it was a time of, of, uh, political passion in Catalonia, I, I would say. And now, now we are not in a time of political passion. We're in a time of, of, uh, I would say of political disappointment and, and of, there's a certain collective, I would say, disappointment or, or uh, a collective grayness at the moment in, uh, on the political level. Uh, and, um, and yeah, in a way, it's an novel about ideologies and about, uh, about the clash between ideologies and about the, about the complexity of life. And, and it's a novel, actually, that uh, I would say it's about uh, that kind of life that doesn't fit in, in ideology. Uh, there is something, ideology is just a, uh, just a structure we use to defend some ideas, to defend some, uh, some things we believe. And sometimes we find, uh, we try to... to to build a rational uh, justifications of our beliefs, but but they are just in, in a certain way they are myths uh, uh, at the same time, and um, so the um, I, I wanted to say something, but uh, sorry, the um, yes, it's a it's a novel about the. Yeah, the, the, there's a moment when the, the shambolic six, these this six uh, uh, illiterate soldiers, they, well, th there's, there are some characters talking about them and about the Carlists, and they say the Carlists were people who fought for his memories with the arms, uh, something like, or with weapons or something like this. And, and it's, 
yeah, something I try to say, it's personal memories, and personal experiences, and, and the things we love and the people we love are sometimes more important when we, when we decide to, to fight politically than ideologies. Uh, and, and I think Catalan literature is, is about this at, at the same time. Catalan has a very long, the Catalan language has a very long uh, story of powerlessness. It, it was a language without political power for many centuries. And it's, in, it's an important fact for me. It's, it's something worth remembering, I would say. And, and the way the illiterate soldiers speak is a tribute to, to that tradition of powerlessness, of a language that is, that is actually uh, a kind of uh, anarchic language. Anarchic language is a language without uh, without an official level, it's a language uh, of of common life, so to say, not not a language of official life. Uh, and it's something. It, of course, it's you know, in a certain way, it's a tragedy. But it's something uh, I think we can we can use in a way, and we can. There, there are some good things in this tradition, in this history of of powerlessness, and we we have to learn about this. I think. Can I just jump in there? Because I think something that Raul said is really important. That, that there's a scene towards the end of the novel where um, there's a small skirmish between, you know, literally a handful of of, of uh, soldiers, liberals and Carlists, and the shambolic six are there. And they're shooting back and forth. And uh, two cousins, well, one, I won't go into the whole story, but he ends up getting up because he needs to go to the toilet. And he, there, there he meets... Um, he meets his cousin and they're in the middle, well, it would be an exaggeration to say the battlefield, but some bullets are flying back and forth and they have a discussion over, well, listen, come over to this side, you know, what are you doing with them? Come over to this side. So like, yeah, but these guys are paying more and yeah, but I don't like those lot and blah, you know, and they're having this discussion on which side to fight for. And, you know, we're, we are technically talking about a war, which, you know, according to the, the history books, wars are based upon, um, high-minded ideals and, um, and, 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 and so forth, you know, but it really in the novel, we see that things are much simpler. And eventually one, uh, the cousin decides to go from the liberals over to, to the Carlists because his cousin convinces him with a story from his youth. You know, I remember when we used to go with uncle, to uh, granddad, Tony to the monastery and we used to, that, that, that monk used to give us chocolate and la la la. It's just shared memories at the end of the day. However, there's something beautiful about that, I think, because within that, there's an inherent sense of community. It's like, we look after ourselves, we look after our own tradition, and we have an inherent distrust of power, of politicians, of kings, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, <clears throat> I'd like to read, uh, you, you just, Tiago, you made me think of a poem by Juan Maragall, which, which, uh, which um, from the Stampa Press published. Uh, it's, a, it's the end of, of uh, Serra Longa. It's, it, it's wonderfully, it has been wonderfully translated by, um, by Roland Pupo. Just, I, I want to read just two lines or three lines of, of this poem because it's, a, it's very interesting. I think it has to do with what you were saying. It's the end of Saralonga. Um, and Saralonga is a mythical, uh, a mythical, uh, um, how would, what would you call him in English? He was a bandule, uh, what's a being? Huh? A bandit or a highwayman. Exactly, a he was a bandit, a, a kind of, of Catalan Robin Hood uh, of, the, of the 17th century. And, and there are, um, and, and yeah, he's, he's dying and he's uh, yeah, thinking, meditating about his life. And he says, I have walked the world to my own delight. I have done what pleased me every instant free, bending to no law, no king, no thing. So the, this is the, the kind of, of Catalan popular tradition that in a way uh, you can find in, in the others as well, in the, in the characters, in, in the popular characters, in the shambolic six, for instance, in the illiterate uh, soldiers. Absolutely. 
Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I think, well, like, I absolutely agree with what you said. Is this really what you feel through and through as you're reading the novel? That's the sense that you keep getting. So at moments as well, I thought some parts of it, it was like a little bit of an of an ode to chaos in a way, adding to, to, to this feeling that you're saying against power and against uh, structures in a way. So that's very interesting. It's wonderful, for example, when the, 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 the chapter about carnival, Carnival Stoltes and Solsona, that you have a territory that's under the rule of, of the, the pretender to the throne, hardline Catholicism, and yet you have this completely raucous, anarchic festival where anything goes. It's the complete opposite, and obviously that's the tradition of carnival, but it's, it's this idea of, yes, ideals and philosophies and beliefs, but up to a certain point, and they're completely arbitrary because on this day of this month, we do the complete opposite of everything that we... We, we preach throughout the rest of the year. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask you one last question uh, before we open the floor um, for, for the audience to ask questions. And it's a question for Raul as well. Now that we're talking about the personal input into you know, how we see things and so on. And, and Tiago said at the very beginning, he knew he was reading something out of fictional um but for me it came later on when suddenly there is a character which is called Raul and it's Raul with an umlaut no Raul and there's a hang on I think that must be him <laughs> so I started um so tell us about why did you do that how is the how is the the relationship how did you imagine the relationship with of the reader with the novel will change in discovering this mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, there's a, the, the narrator, the, the narrator's name is Raul and he's a translator and, and obviously the reader, um, is allowed to think that, that, uh, I am the narrator, but I actually have to say that I invented a lot of things. So, uh, I, I never translated, uh, Lichnowsky's memoirs, uh, like the, the narrator does, and there are, yeah, other things I have made up. So uh, it's not me, it's not me, but it was a way of um, saying that the the voice of novel, the, the narrator's voice is a present day voice. It's a voice of, of someone who could be you, who, who is a, just a translator. And and at the same time, it was my first novel. So I, it, it was a way of of telling the reader, it's a novel about a translator becoming a novelist or becoming a, a, a writer. Uh, and yeah, and translation plays a role in the novel because it's it just, it, it, yeah, one could say it's a novel about translation. It's a novel about a, a, a foreigner who doesn't speak the language and, and he speaks French with, uh, with someone and, and with some other characters, he has no words, but he, he tries to communicate somehow, for instance, with the widow he lives uh, with the, the widow he lives with, he 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 can't speak with her, but he pokes the fire when she's not there, so that she feels that that he cares for her. And um, yeah, it's there are lots of translations, translations of words, translations of gestures, um, and yeah, it's about it's about all this as well. Yeah, I see you nodding. Would you like to add something? I, I was just going to say that um, there's obviously, sorry if you can hear a baby shouting, <laughs> it's dinner time at my house, so, um, and somebody knows it. Um, I was just going to say that there's, there's evidently a lot of Raoul in this novel, as I think there, you, one can expect there to be a, a lot of any novelist in, in their novel, especially the first. Um, but you never know where that line is. And I think it's a, it was a really clever idea to actually use the same name for the narrator because that just uh, reinforces that sense of not the reader not quite knowing where they are, where that, where that line between uh, fiction and, and, and reality is. I enjoyed that. And I like, I like a sort of shameless plug now because... We're going to put out Montserrat Roch with Funda Stampa soon, and she does something similar where there's the idea of getting towards truth through fiction, using a lie to get to essentially to the truth. And I think 
there's a lot of that going on in, in Raoul's novel. Indeed, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I think I'm going to uh, leave some space for the audience to, to ask questions as well, if, if, because I think we've touched on many fascinating topics. So I think it, probably they'll have a lot of a lot of questions. Um, ah, I see some coming through the chat and um, we're being asked if you could tell us a bit about, uh, sorry, if you could tell us a bit more, either Raul, well, everyone, Raul, Tiago and Douglas, about future projects that you have. I'll let you guys go first. You've probably got more news than I do on this, so go for it. Doug, do you want to talk about future from the Stamper books? Or? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, well, I mean, this, yeah, this, uh, hang on a minute. What year are we? Okay, good. Um, this year, 2021, uh, yeah, so... Um, in a couple of weeks, it's going to be, uh, we're going to publish um, Rosemaria Arquimbao's 40 Lost Years, Grand Anish Bardut, uh, which was recuperated uh, a few few years ago by Julia Guillamon um, and published by um, Cuma Negra. Uh, so that's that's really exciting. Um, so, yeah, and then um, a philosoph philosophical essay, which uh, is, is kind of cool, very interesting, by Jose Maria um, Esquirol, and then what Tiago is mentioning, uh, Montserrat Rog, uh, it will be out in November, which is pretty exciting. Next year's, yeah, next year's an interesting list, uh, still finalizing it, so I will kind of keep that under my hat, I guess, for the time being. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, some really, really interesting names, um, and very, very exciting. Uh, very very exciting times. Um, yeah, I, 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 yeah. I mean, I think that's basically the near future, at least for Kumbh Stampa at the moment. Uh, Raúl, have you got anything up your sleeve? Uh, well, I'm 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 working on a new novel at the at the time. So, um, and it's a it's not a historical novel. It's a <laughs> It is set in in Barcelona in Barcelona in the near future, so not not right now, but in two or three years. It's a <laughs> and uh, well, but but we'll see. I'm working on it. It will take some time, some maybe one year, two years more. But uh, well, I'm enjoying it, and there is some there is some. I'm 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 rereading the the Bible and the Old Testament, and there will be something of of biblical storytelling in this novel. I don't know how yet, but <laughs> there will be something of it. We'll see. Um, yeah, and so as as Doug was saying, yeah, um, the first book length translation of Montserrat Roch will be coming out at the end of this year. We formed the Stamper, of course. Um, and then I'll be working on a book by uh, um, Cusa, Jordi Cusa, which is called Wild Horses. Um, it's a fantastic novel which relates um, the drug epidemic in that, that, that through Catalonia, in pretty much all of Southern Europe in the 80s, and relates this um, the, the experiences of, of, of various characters within this within this context and linguistically. Um, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, to give people an idea, maybe Cortázar, elements of Joyce, Burroughs, this, it's in this kind of, this kind of area. Um, so if I survive that, then after that, hopefully a few more interesting projects. It's like Doug said at the start, um, you have to take a step back sometimes because, you know, we really are passionate about Catalan language and literature and, and the themes and the, the landscapes that it discusses. And sometimes there's a tendency that everything you read just feels fantastic and you want to share it. And you really have to think, how would this sound in English and take a step back? Is this what people would be wanting to, to look at potentially? So lots of ideas for projects, but we'll have to see yeah, after, after Kusa what, what, what comes up. But listen, there's so many, there's, 
I, I would say that at the moment, it's a bit of a golden age for Catalan literature. There's a lot of really interesting authors doing uh, really, really interesting work at the moment. Yes, for me, every time I come back, I come with a, a bag full of books, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the things to read over here. Um, oh, we have a question. Uh, the main protagonist of the novel is a German aristocrat, and the book reflects uh, the German mentality quite well. How was the process of creating this character? Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, uh, I, um, I, I, well, I read a lot of um, memoirs written by German, by Prussian uh, soldiers who fought on the Carlist side. So it's it, actually it's something that it was not that that rare at the time. There were uh, young Prussian aristocrats who traveled south to fight for the Carlists in the 19th century. And for instance, there is a book by Lichnowsky, by, by the Prince of Lichnowsky, which is a historical character. And, and he fought uh, on the Carlist side and, and he wrote uh, a quite interesting book about his experiences uh, in, in Catalonia and, and in Spain. So I, I tried to read about historical characters that had something to do with, with my uh, main character. This was one thing. Then there was another thing. I'm, I've always been interested in, in German culture in, and in German literature and mainly German romantic literature. And there is an idea in Germany, uh, a very strong idea in German culture about the North and the South, about the, about the South as a place of innocence, of, of light, of, of beauty. And uh, it's the, the kind of thing that, that uh, Germans uh, think when they come to uh, the Balearic Islands, to Mallorca, or to Barcelona, or <laughs> things like this, and um, it's it's interesting because you can find it in in Goethe's Faust, for instance. In in many German books, you f there is a, a, a young character who goes to the south and rediscovers life, uh, so the the true uh, meaning of life. And well, it's it's an ideal, an idealistic view of the South that had nothing to do with my world. So, but it's very important for for the, for a German for the German culture in general. So the the main character has this idea in his head in a way, and and he goes to the South looking for innocence, for purity, for for a for a for a, um, yeah for tradition, for religion, for truth, and he finds. Uh, just the shambolic six who are uh, crazy young guys who, yeah, <laughs> who, are, who have nothing to do with him. I enjoyed as well this kind of militaristic element of Prussian culture of, of, of fathers sending their sons as well off to go and off to fight. You know, this is what you need to do and, and this is what will give you a, a foot up in the world, which is all very well and good sending someone off to fight, someone else off to fight, isn't it? I particularly liked as well Lichnowsky because Lichnowsky feels to me like he has that um, presence of what I would see as the typical Prussian, very right? cynical, strong, mm -hmm. uh, masculine, and he knows why he's there in 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 Solsona and Catalonia fighting this strange war. He's there for very very um, uh, selfish, I, well, or at least personal reasons. Whereas uh, Wilhelm's much more naive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah well, well, while I was reading the novel, I often thought that this, um, of course, it's a novel for all audiences, but I thought it was a novel that very appealing for young people, because it's it has this idealistic and naive um, aura to the to the main character, and I thought that was very enjoyable to, to read. Mm. Yeah. I have another question uh, for the three of you, actually. I've seen, if I'm not mistaken, that in uh, Funda Stampa Press, there is a playlist uh, for each of, of the books. And I was wondering, how is this negotiated between the three of you, if it is, or like, how, how does it come to be? Well, you know, there's a playlist that I saw on Twitter today or yesterday for Wild Horses by, by Jordi Pusa. And music is a really important element in, the, in this novel. And this playlist is, I think there's about 20, 20 or 25 songs on it. Um, 
but with the ones with the novels for Funda Stampa, yeah, we, we, everyone, put, all the translators put together a, a short playlist just to give an idea of a kind of musical introduction into, into the novel. Yeah. Well, I, I thought it was a brilliant idea. Douglas, were you about to add something? Oh, no, 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 I wasn't. No, no, it, it was, it's, uh, it's fun. It's, it's, it's good fun, this, uh, having this playlist of the novel and, you know, sort of, and I suppose it's just another way for a reader to, to be able to sort of, you know, um, interact with the novel, with these ideas, and it's, you know, it's, it's a way of sort of, um, this, you know, um, the translator and also the author giving, giving some of their ideas um, about how the novel speaks to them as well. Yeah, I think it is fun kind of um, finding a link between the specials and Ghost Town and Brawl's novel. I think that's quite a <laughs> great we're trying to bring 1970s Birmingham with the 19th century Sol Sona. Yeah, no, but it's cool. I mean, I think it's, you know, even if I say so myself, I think it's quite a good idea. Um, you know, uh, and I think, yeah, for each book, you can see sort of, I don't know, I quite like the idea of, you know, someone buying the book and then they sit down and, you know, they sit down in their armchair and they they whack on the playlist just to get them in the mood before they start reading and, you know, and uh, I don't know, it's just a bit of fun, really. Yeah, thank you. Well, I don't know if our audience is sending us any more questions. If anyone just has a shy one and they're <laughs> indecisive, send it now. <laughs> See? Um, I think it's been a, a very, very excellent presentation. Thank you very much. It's been so exciting all that you talked about that I'm, I'm thinking to reread the book, like starting tomorrow, you know, I think I'm going to just get back to it again because it, it was very, very very interesting and very thought provoking all that you said. So thank you. And I don't see any any more questions coming. So unless you want some, uh, you want to add something else, maybe we would call it a day. I, I, I would like to to thank you very much, uh, Raúl, Thiago, and uh, Douglas uh, for this uh, great uh, presentation of the book. And uh, as I said uh, before, it's a great. Uh, novel with a deep no i mean there are so many readings and uh, i think uh, raul and tiago had explained very well the different uh, possibilities which are uh, very different and uh, it's not a history book but there is a lot of uh, history at the same time and uh, and as i uh, when i ask uh, the about the german mentality it's astonishing how you through the book has uh, reached this uh, knowledge and this uh, uh, communication, communicating the reader, the, the main uh, character. So congratulations for the book, congratulations uh, for, the, uh, for the work of the, of the publishing house, for the translation, and Christina for your uh, presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, we are very happy to, for this experience together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah, thanks for thanks for the opportunity to speak about the books. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. So we come to an end. Next week we have also on, on Tuesday a uh, New York uh, um, a conference about the medieval um, con uh, congress that is celebrating in in uh, Leeds. Uh, presentation of Juan Carlos Conde about uh, Middle Ages none, something very different but also related to history. So see you soon. Thank you very much. And next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you.